All right, turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. Uh, what an incredible summer we've had here at the church uh, with this series that we've been teaching on called Believe. And really, what it is is designed to help each and every one of us get closer to God. I think there's something amazing that happens when you kind of go back to your roots and you look at really what makes us a church, what makes us a child of God, really at the foundations of who we are as men and women that serve Jesus Christ. So, you know, we've had incredible things go on in the church. The church has grown during the summer, which is an ano anomaly in the body of Christ. Uh, and, and that's just, to me, a reflection of God's grace on our church. And, um, you know, it's been incredible to go through these topics on salvation, Holy Spirit, water baptism, grace, all of this amazing stuff. And in the last couple of weeks, we've taken a, a little turn and focused on the church. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about being a part of the church family and what um, uh, God says about the church, what God says about being in the church, what he does for the church. Last week, we talked about being a part of the giving family. And this week, we're going to focus a little bit on being a part of the serving family. Listen, there's three families that make up every church in the world, and it is those three. It's the attending family, the giving family, and the serving family. All three are interconnected, and to be honest, none of them can survive without the other. See, the giving family makes happen everything financially. The serving family makes happen everything that needs to get taken care of. We have over 1,600 active volunteers in our church that serve on a regular basis. And let's give them a great round of applause, amen? And then of course, there's the attending family, which if without the attending family, there would be no giving family or serving family. Today we're gonna to focus on living a life of service, not just at church, but at home, in your everyday lives. And I believe that living a life of service is one of the greatest ways that you and I as children of God can get closer to God. But not only do you get closer to God, it is truly one of the key ways of seeing his divine favor and his supernatural presence in your ordinary lives. Really, choosing to be a servant in your life is uh, one of the main ways that God infuses his extraordinary power into our ordinary lives. To put it biblically, it's God's supernatural infused into our natural lives. You'll see in the next min few minutes how God uses the heart of a servant to bring promotion and increase into our everyday lives. So turn with me now, or before we do that, this is what's amazing about this is, you know, the reality of the kingdom of God is that so often the kingdom of God works in direct contrast to the kingdom of earth, of the earth. See, in Christ, the way up is down. The way to receive is to give. The way to reap is to sow. The way to be exalted is to be humble. God works in direct contrast to the ways of the world, but how many of you know that God's ways are the right ways? Can I get a good amen? Amen. amen. So Matthew 23, verse 12 says, he who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. I wanna read this to you out of the Message Bible. The guys are gonna put it on the screen. Look at this, it says, do you want to stand out? Then step down. Be a servant. If you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you. Well, I don't want that. But if you're content to simply be yourself, literally that means if you'll be who God made you to be and do what God asked you to do. Look at this. Your life will count for plenty. Do you want to stand out? 
Do you want your life not just to count, but to count for plenty? Jesus says here, if you do, just be who I made you to be. And what did he make us to be? He made us to be servants. And what has he asked us to do? Matthew 6, says, to seek first the advancement of God's kingdom and his righteousness. So Jesus says that the priority of every Christian's life should be, number one, to advance his kingdom. And how do you advance his kingdom? You do it through advancing the church of Jesus Christ. And number two, really not even number two, more like 1A, is to seek, actively pursue his righteousness. Simply put, his rightness. The beautiful thing about that is God says, if you'll just advance my kingdom and try to submit your life to my rightness, my right ways of doing things, it goes on to say that all these things, all the promises of God will be added onto your life. Promises of joy, of peace, of happiness, success, welfare, and prosperity. Promises of being blessed. Promises of having strong, healthy relationships. Promises of being promoted, promises of being healed, all the promises, all the promises of walking in God's divine grace, his abundance of mercy, of all your sins being forgiven, all the promises will be added onto your life if you will just set the motivation of your life to building his kingdom and doing things his way. So here's the question. Do you want your life to stand out. Do you? Do you? By a show of hands, how many of you want your life to count for plenty? Boy, I do. Guess what? So does God. In fact, God wants it more than even you want it. Did you know in Ephesians 3 verse 20, it says that he is ready and able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything you could ever ask or even dream. God has greater dreams for your life than you even know yet. God wants more than you want to make all your dreams come true. And not only does he want to make them come true, he wants them to be even better than you've even thought of yet. God's like, I've got levels you haven't even dreamed of for your life. Come and get on my level. Oh my goodness. He has a great life for you. You know, we put on the billboard this weekend, this week, God has great plans for you. God is good and he doeth good. Jeremiah 29, 11, for he knows the thoughts he has towards you. Thoughts of good, never of evil. Why? To bring you a hope and a future. He wants your dreams to come true. He wants you to be successful. And in fact, he wants you to have a great, great life. Matthew 20, verse 26 says this. Whoever desires to be great. Did you know that it's okay to desire to be great? It's totally okay for you to want your life to be great to be significant, to have an impact, to leave a legacy. I want the people whose lives I am involved in for them to want me in their lives, for me to bear positive effect on their lives. I want them to think of, when they think of their relationship with me, that somehow I affect them in a positive way, that somehow, some way, I can attribute them to seeing the love of Jesus or to helping them out. I don't want them to be like, well, if Jared left my life, who really cares? See, I want my life to be great. It's okay to want your life to be great. The question is, how and why? Jesus says, whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. So what does that mean? The literal definition of being a servant means this, to advance others' interest above their own. Hey, can I take a moment and give you some really good marital advice? You want a good marriage? Go advance your spouse's interests above your own. 
You know, it's amazing how my wife never gets upset with me when I want to spend three and a half hours watching a cowboy game when I've made sure that the, my stuff in my household isn't taken care of. You know, when my house is in order, she doesn't care. But when it's in chaos, you're going to watch what? You know, I have never had this counseling appointment. You know, my husband, I mean, I just can't get this guy to stop helping me with the laundry. I mean, can you believe that this guy gets up and helps me with the dishes? I've never had a couple come in and, and, and ask for counseling because the spouse is just too helpful around the house. Jared, can you talk to him? I mean, he stood in the kitchen and, and, and wanted to talk to me and pay attention to me while I made dinner. Can you believe the nerve of this guy? <laughs> and then afterwards, he put the dishes in the dishwasher. Who is this man? <laughs> I've never had that conversation. Not once. A lot of the ladies are like, who is that guy? <laughs> For real. <laughs> Boy, you want a strong marriage, just help out. Serve your spouse. Just serve them. Sit down and talk to them. Listen to them. Hug them. Be nice. Amen. Yeah. That was good teaching. It literally means to advance others' interests above their, you know, that's the very theme of the Bible. The very theme of the Bible is to do more for others than you do for yourself. Amen. It also means one who promotes the welfare and prosperity of God's church. Amen. Listen, there's one thing in the earth that God is building, and that is his church. Amen. So if you want greatness in your life, be a part of what he's building. Serve his church. You know, at minimum, come to church. At minimum, come to church. Maybe you don't have time or the resources to be a volunteer, but come to church. You know, we need you to pray for us. We need you to be nice on Facebook and to represent Jesus Christ so people around you want to come with you. You know, I believe that God built this amazing sanctuary for every seat to be filled five times a week. How do we do it? You know, Christianity starts in your living room. You start by getting your family saved. Amen. Well, I can't believe what's going on in the world. You know what? I have decided in my life I'm not going to lose sleep over stuff I can't control. What I can control is that I can teach Caleb, my son, to love and to respect his Lord and Savior, Jesus. That is what I can control. I can control myself. I can't control what's going on in Afghanistan or in Washington. I can't control all of that, so I'm not going to lose sleep about it. I'm going to pray about it. What I can control is that when I'm out in the community, I display the love and the grace that Jesus Christ has given to me, and that is all I can control. So I'm not going to lose sleep over what I can't control, but I can advance God's kingdom. It also means... Those whom God carries out his administration on earth. It literally means to be a living example of Jesus' love and grace. Verse 28 in Matthew 20 says, Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. And you know, if there was any person that ever walked the earth that deserved to be served, it was Jesus. And yet, he didn't. See, only God in his infinite wisdom and his divine sovereignty could take something so simple, so opposite of the world, like serving, which is giving up of yourself, which is doing more for others, which is putting the kingdom of God first. Only he could take something so simple like that, the choice to be a servant and make it the key to greatness. It's not faith. It's not a certain talent or ability. He didn't make mercy the key to greatness, not hope. He made serving the key to greatness. Do you want to connect with God? I believe you do. With his greatness, with his impossibilities, with his promise? Do you want your life to flourish, to advance and to walk in the fullness of his blessing? If the answer to those questions is yes, then your response is, 
to be a servant. Serve God with all your heart, with intense passion. Serve his church, but also serve your life. Serve your spouse, serve your kids, serve your work, serve our community. God is so amazing that when you do, he will infuse his extraordinary power into our ordinary lives. Every one of us was created unique and special, blessed with a variety of talents, abilities, and resources, not only to build ourselves a great lives, a great life, but to advance God's kingdom. And he does it when we make a choice to be a servant. Now, here's the beautiful thing. There's three characteristics that every servant is, is made up of, and all of them, number one, is a choice. That's the beauty of it, is that it's not a talent or an ability. Because if it was, certain people would be left out. But they're all a choice. And through these three characteristics is where we see God infuses his extraordinary power to bring his greatness into our lives. So you ready? Let's learn what the three things are. Number one, to be a servant, every servant has a heart of generosity. Every servant must have a generous heart. I believe that our world needs more generosity. I think we have maxed out on our quota for stinginess and selfishness. Can I get a good amen? You know what else we've maxed out? Negativity on social media. Stop. We've maxed it out, huh? But God's give given us these talents and abilities, resources, finance, finances, not just for us, but for us to recognize that these gifts are given to us to bless others and to serve those around us. Amen. See, we can all be generous. Well, I don't have a lot of money. Generosity goes so far beyond money. Amen. At times, it includes money. But you know, you can be generous with your love. You can be generous with a kind word, a helping hand. I got an email from a lady a couple months ago and she said that she had been dealing with intense depression, had had thoughts of suicide, and one night on Wednesday she was driving home from work and she saw our billboard and she said that just kind of like, just ended up in our parking lot. And so she walked in and the lady greeted her and said, hi, thank you so much for being here. Don't forget, God loves you and he's always on your side. And she said that in that moment, she just broke down in tears. She's been coming ever since. It's amazing what just a kind word, just a simple word, hey, you're awesome. You're good. It's amazing what telling your wife that she's incredible can do in your marriage. Saying thank you. How about giving some forgiveness? Amen. You know, who are we as Christians to say that God has and will forgive all our sins, but we st still haven't forgiven a family member for something they did 10 years ago? Wow. A kind word, a helping hand. You know, it's amazing how far generosity can go to show the love of God. And look what God does. Proverbs 11, verse 24, in the Message Bible, they're gonna put it on the screens. Watch this. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Now watch this. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Amen. Not just blessed, abundantly blessed. Like more than you know blessing, like more than you need blessing, a little bit extra blessing, blessing you didn't even expect, exceedingly abundantly blessing. So if you choose, God says, to just bless others, be generous, live a life of generosity, hey, you know, you could open the door for someone. God will abundantly bless your life. And look what it says. Those who help others 
will be helped. How many of you know that at some point in life, on some level, you're going to need some help with something? Guess what? Jesus says, I will be your ever-present help in your time of need. And what is the key? Those who bless others, those who help others, will be abundantly blessed, will always be helped. Your life will get bigger and bigger. God uses our generosity to serve and to bless others, and the result is his divine expansion and increase in our lives, his extraordinary into our ordinary. Serving and generosity, listen, are synonymous with one another. You cannot be a servant and be stingy at the same time. Every true servant has a heart of generosity. And who set the example for it? Jesus Christ did. He came not to be served, but to serve. And then he says, and to give his life. Serving and generosity run hand in hand. Number two, a true servant has a faithful heart. A faithful heart. Jesus said in Matthew 25 that he who is faithful over little will be made ruler over much. Servanthood has a faithful spirit about it, and God uses your faithfulness to promote you and to advance your life. See, we've all been given dreams, we've all been given visions, we all have plans for our lives and our futures, and God will take you there if you will choose today to be faithful in where you're at right now. Amen. Right now. I had a couple in my office a while back, and uh, the man was, in his words, angry with God. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, you know, this Jesus stuff, he literally did, this Jesus stuff doesn't work. And I said, well, how's that? Because it does work, you know? And so um, his wife was looking at him like this, like, <laughs> anyways. Um, so he goes on to tell me that he had submitted for a promotion, and in the process, he lost his job. And I thought, wow, well, that didn't work out, you know? And so... He's like, and yeah, you know, and I prayed about it, and God didn't answer my prayer, and that's this, you know, and, and his wife goes, well, why don't you just tell him the truth? And I went, oh, there we are. <laughs> so she proceeded to tell me how he had gotten written up multiple times for being late to work, how he got written up for not obeying the dress code, and how he got busted for spending too much personal time on the internet while being at work. Um, and so then, in the process of it, he actually lost his job. And I thought, you know, God didn't say, go do whatever the heck you want, and then I'll promote you. He said, be faithful in what I've given you, and then I'll make you ruler over much. See, don't be mad at God because you haven't gotten promoted, but you've been doing a terrible job. No, 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 that's not God's fault. That's your fault. Amen. You want to get promoted, go do better than your coworkers. Amen. Work harder, work smarter, work more efficient. Become the guy that your boss thinks of every morning when a new project arises. He thinks, I got to give it to him. He's the best one. Oh, you'll get promoted? Don't even worry about it. You'll get promoted. You can, why? Because your boss cares about results. Go get results, you'll get promoted. Be faithful over little, you'll be made ruler over much. The characteristics, the biblical characteristics of a faithful person are this, honest, trustworthy, reliable, timely, and consistent. Hey, you want a business? Be faithful in the job God's given you right now. Amen. Part of the translation of being faithful over little, when you really study it out, part of it is being faithful even over what is another man's. So you have a dream in your heart to open a business, be faithful in a, the other man's company that you're currently working in. You want a great marriage? Serve your family and be faithful to your wife. And husband, wives, not just you. I like picking on the husbands today, huh? Sorry, ladies, you too. Hey, be honest. Be trustworthy in your house. Be reliable. You know, if you say you're on your way home from work, don't show up two and a half hours later. 
Be timely. Be consistent. You want a, a promotion? Go do the best job you can ever do. You want great kids? Get on the path that you need them to go on and they'll follow you. Teach them faithfulness. Teach them to be honest, to be consistent, to be generous, to be timely. You can't expect your kids to be something that you're not. See, you faithfully serve your spouse, your kids, your church. You do your job with excellence. God sees it and he rewards it. And the more he sees it, the more he rewards it. And the longer you're faithful, the longer God will constantly build your life. So, how to become great. Number one, generosity. Number two, faithfulness. And number three, every servant has a heart of humility. They have a humble heart. The Bible says in Luke 14, 11, for that for whoever exalts himself shall be made low, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Once again, God's ways are the opposite of the world. That doesn't make sense in the world's ways, but God uses humility to advance and exalt your life. A true servant is someone who has a humble heart. Why? Because serving is the right thing to do. And people who are, have a humble heart, they serve because it is the right thing to do. And doing what is right is always the right thing to do. They don't serve for self-seeking or recognition or for fame or glory. They serve because serving is the right thing to do. Doing more for others is what God has asked us to do. Putting other people's interests above your own is what God has asked us to do. Being a blessing to others is what God has asked us to do. Not for fame, not for self-seeking, not for glory, simply because it is what God has asked us to do, and if you'll just do it that way, then God will go ahead and just exalt your life. It means literally to be lifted above the rest. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Again, there's nothing wrong with wanting your life to be great. It's how you go about doing it. And he says to do it through serving. Now, see, I saved this for the last because I think humility, well, at least for me, it's the most difficult. It's easy for me to be generous. Like, I'll open the door for you. That's easy. It's easy for me to say, hey, you're awesome. Go do a great job today. That's easy. But to be humble? Oh. See, I tend personally, can I just be a little transparent? Okay. Well, I'm going to do it anyways. I got the mic. I tend to be a supremely confident person. And um, yeah, I just believe with all my heart that God's grace is sufficient for me because um, I believe the word of God. Um, and I tend to walk confidently. The issue with humility is that when your confidence isn't harnessed in the right direction, confidence can become overconfidence. And overconfidence can become arrogance, and arrogance becomes pride. And pride, the Bible says, leads to your fall. So a few years ago, I was working here at the church, and I wasn't the most pleasant guy. So from like 14 to like 26, I was not a nice guy. Can I just be honest? I mean, I was just... The opposite of humility. Arrogant, overconfident, a little bit entitled. Okay, a lot of bit entitled. I won't lie on the pulpit, Jesus. A lot entitled. <laughs> so one day after being a jerk at the office, my dad came in and we had a moment. <laughs> How many of y'all know my dad can get to the point? Put it shortly, I would say the summary was obnoxious. What he said to me was, you're not teachable and you're not correctable. 
And that is the opposite of humility. See, a person with humility is always teachable and always correctable. Amen. If you cannot receive wisdom from someone, you have an issue with humility. If people around you who are more successful than you are giving you advice and you reject it, you have an issue of humility. You don't have a humble heart. You are leaning into pride and arrogance. If your spouse is telling you what you're do is, doing is hurting me and you keep doing it, you are not serving your spouse. And you have an issue of humility. See, I had a massive issue with that. Massive. And I had to start dealing with it. And the way you deal with not having a humble heart is to become teachable, to become re uh, 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 correctable. Therefore, you can reject selfish pride. See, there's a good kind of pride. There's a good kind. I mean, I'm proud that we gave 450 backpacks to kids in need last week. I'm proud that we're giving several hundred tennis shoes to kids this week who are in need. I'm proud of that. That's, that's pride that I believe glorifies God. See, I'm proud that as a church family, we'll give 20,000 toys this year. That's awesome. But see, being teachable and correctable helps you to reject selfish pride. And you do it, listen, when you attach your life to a cause greater than yourself. I remember the day I got married, I had this inner sense that suddenly my life meant more. That Carla was brought into my life and now my life meant more. And I needed to be a certain man for her. And I just felt this sense of responsibility. I remember the day that uh, we, Caleb was born and I sat in the room with him and I remember I touched him on the forehead and it was the first time I ever touched him. And I went like this and I remember in that moment in my spirit I thought, oh my Lord, my life is so much bigger now. I've got to do this right. And at some point, when I was working here at Abundant Living, I truly committed my heart to the cause of advancing God's kingdom. Wait, you didn't do that before you started working? No, I'll admit it, I didn't. Look, you can be at church a lot and just going through the motions, you know? Like, <laughs> Full extension, too. Well, how come Ezra's not singing today? Seriously? Well, Pastor Charles isn't here, so... You know, you can be at church a lot. Hey, I went to school for years and just totally checked out. I was in school all the time, didn't learn anything. <laughs> when I didn't want to. It wasn't the teacher's fault. Amen. You can be in church. Well, I would go to church. Okay, but I mean, are you going to church? Are you submitted to the goodness of God while in church? Are you listening and receiving? Amen. See, you can go through the motions and, <laughs> and leave here exactly the same. But if you're going to be here, why not get everything God has for you? Amen? Amen? <laughs> There's something spectacular that happens when you attach your life to a cause greater than yours. At minimum, pray for the church. Think about the church. Promote the church in the community in a positive way. Well, the church isn't perfect. No church is perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. 
but the church of God is something we should all be a part of. Join the giving family. Start giving. Start serving in the church when you can. I'm telling you, there is something divine that happens in your heart when you're standing in the county coliseum and the thousands of kids come around that corner and see the toys and you know that many of them, that's going to be the only gift they get and you get to be a part of bringing that joy into their lives. There's something spectacular that happens in your heart when you see the kids get the backpacks and they're so heavy, stuffed with stuff that their parents have to help them pick them up and take them. There's something that takes place in your heart when the kid takes his shoe off that you gave him last year and puts on the new shoe or when your kid gets in the car and starts quoting to you scripture that they learned in kids' church and it's scripture that you don't even no. There's something spectacular that happens when you come and you're an actor or a dancer and you give up so much time during the holidays for weeks to practice, but you're here during Christmas and every night 800, 1,000, 1,500 people raise their hand to accept Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And you know in that moment that you played a part of the angels rejoicing in heaven and that those people and their families' lives will never be the same and they will be affected for eternity. There's something spectacular that happens when you choose to seek first the advancement of God's kingdom. Would you watch this video quickly? What I do here at the symphony office, I'm the director of fund development. So I look for funding, especially for our education and outreach programs, because those are very near and dear to my heart and all of our hearts. And that's where we get to take music to the kids. So I've been in Abundant almost 14 years. And when I first went, I originally wanted to join the choir, but I didn't know the songs. So I said, well, I'll stay, I'll stay for a while and kind of learn the songs. But while I was waiting, I, there was an advertisement for a camera or video, and that caught my attention. And so I, I volunteered for video, and I forgot choir for many, many years. And then I went to kids' church, because my grandson was going, and I just wanted to give back, because they were giving so much to him. And I've been there for four years now, and I love them. I teach them on Sunday second service is my service to teach. I believe that those little ones not only take it in, but they, they give it out to their families that may not go to church, that they're, you know, to their friends. Yeah, that they're our little ambassadors because they have no fear of sharing. You're coming to a very big church. There's a lot of people and there's a lot of things going on. And the way to make that church smaller is to volunteer because the more involved you get, the smaller it gets. And you, you get to know so many people that you can go to if you need prayer. It just makes the church smaller and it makes you more grounded and planted. Like Pastor always says, you need to be planted. Serving gives me life. It just gives me something to do that's powerful. You know, when I serve the little ones, it's awesome when they run up to me and say, teacher, I'm like, I'm a teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher. Um, it's just, it's life. It's my life now. It's my life. I cannot imagine not doing it. I can't imagine it. My name is Pam, and this is why I serve. Just a couple more minutes. This is the reality that we're at as a church family as a whole. Um, we need you. First, we need you to be a part of the church family. We need you in attendance. We need you in prayer. We need you in setting the example of Jesus Christ in the community of El Paso. There's enough negativity in the world that we don't need to be a part of the problem. The church of Jesus Christ should be a part of the solution. Amen? 
We also need you to be a part of the giving family like we talked last week, but we really need you also to be a part of the serving family. There's many misconceptions when you come to a church like ours of our size. One of the misconceptions is this is a big church. They've got it all figured out. They've got more than enough people, and it's all taken care of. And the reality is that's not true. It takes over 500 volunteers a week just to run the kids' department. We need ushers. We need greeters. We need nursery workers. Youth people, bus ministry people, jail ministry. We need people in the lobby, in the bookstores, in coffee shops, in the food pantry. We need people during the week that'll come and help in the office or help Ron and Carrie with the production. We need singers, dancers, guitar players, drummers, bass players. We need you. We need you. God has gifted you with talents and abilities to build his kingdom. Well, you may think, I, don't, I can't sing or I can't dance. My talents aren't useful. Yes, they are. We will find a place for you. Well, I don't have a lot of time to give. Honestly, we'll take whatever you can give us. Amen. We have people that serve once every six, eight weeks, all the way to the other extreme where people that serve every service of every week all year long. We'll take everything and anywhere in the middle of that. Well, I'm already serving in one area. You can serve in as many as you want. Here's the beautiful thing about being a part of the serving family. It's one more extension of you being a part of the only thing in society that bears eternal impact, and that is when you affect people for the love of Jesus. It enacts the law of seed time and harvest. When you sow into God's kingdom, you will reap his harvest. It makes a large church small, like Pam said on that video. It gets you connected. You'll make friends who are building their lives just like you are on the things of the word of God, on his righteousness. You'll know people, you'll see people. You'll have people who will stand with you in a time of need, who will walk through the fire with you. When everybody else is leaving you or deserting you, they'll stand and fight the fight of faith and you'll meet them here at church. It gets your life aligned with God's vision and purpose. I tell you what, it keeps your life in perspective. I remember one time at the toy giveaway, my wife and I the night before, before had argued about where we were gonna go to dinner. I mean, literally we're arguing about where we're gonna pay people to make food for us. And I remember those kids came around that corner and I thought, well that was a really stupid argument. It's amazing how serving brings your life into perspective. We need you, church family. I ask you today if you will prayerfully prayerfully consider joining the serving family. There's no guilt or condemnation if you can't. Like I said, at most, be a servant in your house. Serve your house. Display the love of Jesus Christ in our community. And that's where God will infuse his extraordinary power into your life. Greatness comes when you choose to be a servant. But if you can, would you pray about joining the serving family? When the service is over, there's tables throughout the lobby. Every department of our church is represented. Would you go talk to them? Get the information? Call us during the week? You can fill out a volunteer application. It's a simple process. We do run a background check, and that's because our insurance requires us to, plus we believe in the safety of our church family. Unfortunately, 1% of 1% of society has ill will, and we have to guard against that, and I believe that's the right thing to do, and even more so for the kids, amen? Amen. Would you join our church, our serving family? Think about it, pray about it. We need you. And this is the time. God's doing amazing things in our church. Last weekend, we had the biggest attendance in our church history. God's favor is still on it, and it is going to expand even greater into the west side of El Paso. But we can't wait until that building is built to start getting volunteers for it. We need to start now. Would you please pray about it?